Uh, hi everyone, welcome to the last keynote of the day. Today we're going to have Forbes 30 under 30, Victoria Caña, who's going to talk about her experience going from board games to making games at Riot Games. All right, welcome. Hi everyone, nice to meet you. My name is Victoria Caña and I am really excited to be here. I'm going to be talking today uh, about From Paper to Pixels, how I turned my hobby as a board game designer into a career in video games. In this talk, I'm going to talk about how I started out as a university student who tried making a tabletop game for fun with my friends using only things like paper, pencils, and printer ink. And actually doing that gave me the foundational skills and knowledge in areas like product strategy, game design, art direction, production, and marketing, so that way I could go on to have a successful career in both the board game and video game industries. So for first, a little bit about me. I'm currently a lead producer working on an unannounced project at Riot Games. I also recently had the honor of making it on the Forbes 30 under 30 list for games. Before that, I used to be a product strategist and producer at Wizards of the Coast. And I also used to be a management consultant at Deloitte, who I know is one of the sponsors of, the, of this event. Some of the games that I've worked on include Magic the Gathering, Legends of Runeterra, Dungeons and Dragons, and I also co-designed a few board games like Hot Takes and Gladius. So first, I want to start out with where and when my experience with games began. So I've loved playing games for a long time, ever since I was a little girl. And I played games starting out with Snake on my mom's old Nokia phone. I played games like Super Smash Bros and Mario Party on the GameCube. I played PC games like the MMO Maple Story and many other tabletop games. But I never seriously thought about pursuing a career in video games. I actually didn't even know it was possible to have a career in games. But all of that changed when I was a student in university. I went to New York University and I was majoring in communications because I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. I thought maybe something in advertising, maybe something in marketing. And around that time, I started dating my now husband named Alexander Uboldi. And for those of you who are in a relationship or who have been in a relationship, you'll probably know that when you date somebody, you typically try to find things that you and the other person have in common, so that way you can do that thing together. And one of the things that Alex and I both really enjoyed was playing games. So we played lots of different board games together and also various other video games. And related to that, we tried to go to different types of gaming events near our university that we could enjoy together. And one of those event events was a game festival in New York City called Tribeca Games. At this event, Riot Games, the studio behind the hit game League of Legends, brought their development team to talk about everything they would do to make League of Legends. So we got to hear from everyone from the game designers, the artists, the marketers, the sound designers, and everything that they would do to make the game. And while we were there, we actually got to speak with Stone Labrandi, a lead game designer at Riot Games and also a professor of game design at Carnegie Mellon University. And like I had mentioned before, I never seriously considered pursuing game development as a full-time career. But I was so inspired by all of the game developers who spoke that day. And I was really inspired by, by the fact that they were able to turn something that they were passionate about, games, into something that they would spend their full-time career doing. So I asked Stone, hey Stone, if we want to become game developers, what would you recommend to aspiring students as one of the first steps that we should take. And Stone smiled to us and told us, if you want to be a game developer, the very first thing that you should do is try to make your own game using paper. Yes, that's right. He said, try making your own game using paper. 
And the reason that he said this is one of the reasons that at many game, uh, in many game design programs in the United States, one of the first classes that you take is typically a game design class where you, where you make a tabletop game. It's because if you take a game and you take away the images, the sound, the controls, what's left? What's left is a system. It's a set of rules. And it's often said that tabletop games are one of the purest forms of system design. And this is exactly why Stone recommended that we just try to make a game with paper, pencils, and anything that we had at our house. It's also very accessible. So we did exactly that. We found random things at our house and we tried making a bunch of different game prototypes. We made a game called Legions of Rome, an area control game where you moved around different units in hopes to gain control of the Roman Empire. We made a game called Saviors of Japan, which was a cooperative deck building game where you and your friends worked together to try to defeat monsters in order to save a fantasy version of Japan. And all of these prototypes had varying levels of success and were varying levels of fun. And eventually, we went on to make a prototype for a game called Gladius. So what is Gladius? Gladius is a board game where you play as Roman spectators who bet on and rig the gladiatorial games. The reason that we wanted to make this game was because we knew that there were a lot of different board games out there where you would play as gladiators fighting other gladiators, but we thought it would be pretty fun if we could make a game that was instead focused on the spectators in the Colosseum and the potential betting and collusion that could happen on the side. And you can see on the left-hand side, this is a picture of some of our earliest prototypes of Gladius, where we really just found random images on the internet, printed them out, put them in some card sleeves, uh, made up some rules, and tested them with our friends and family. And on the right, you can see what Gladius would eventually go on to be once we finally published it. So when we were first starting to make Gladius, we put together a product vision and a strategy. And the reason that we did this is because we were first-time uh, first game developers. And in my opinion, I thought it would be pretty irresponsible of us to spend a significant portion of our time, money, and resources to make a game unless we at least put together a plan. And so we started out with a vision. We wanted to make a board game about betting on and rigging the gladiatorial games. The next step was we figured out who our audience was. Who did we think that we would be making this game for? We narrowed it down to newer and less experienced gamers who wanted more board games that they could try. But oftentimes, when they try to play board games, they would find that games are either too easy or too hard. We wanted to target hobbyist board gamers who wanted more games that they could play with their, with their friends and attract them to the hobby. And we also wanted to target underrepresented gamers who didn't see themselves in the games they played that often. Once we figured out who our audience was, we needed to understand what their needs were or the various problems that we wanted to solve. So we knew that they were looking for board games that players of multiple different skill levels could play together and still have fun. They needed games that could be enjoyable even when you're not the person winning. They needed games that could be good warm-up games or games that could be fun to play if you have a limited amount of time. And they also needed thoughtful and diverse representation in the games that they were playing. Once we knew our audience and we knew their needs, it became very clear to us what type of product we, would, what type of product we needed to make and the requirements that uh, it would have. So the game would need to be shorter in game length, easy to learn, have social engaging gameplay, a combination of luck and skill required to win, the game should minimize the feel-bad moments among players. And we wanted it to have a fantasy version of Rome with a diverse cast of characters and an accessible price point. Lastly, we had to figure out what our business goals were for our company and also for ourselves. So in my mind, my thinking was, well, we want to be game developers. 
but we have never made a game uh, before. So why on earth would anybody want to hire us? And that's why one of our top business goals was, if we try to make this game, we would be able to learn important skills in order to make a game, and also hopefully gain credibility to show different companies that we are legit, we are credible, we can make a game, and you should hire us. I also wanted to make sure that we would avoid something that I jokingly called avoiding financial ruin, or essentially spending too much money making this game uh, only to lose all our money <laughs> in the end. And as a stretch goal, I did want us to have the opportunity to make a profit, but that wasn't first and foremost our goal because we were mostly doing this as a learning experience and to make a good product. The next step that we took was we conducted market research on other comparable games. So that way we can learn from their successes and their failures and apply them to the game that we were making. So we took a look at other published betting games on the market. And what we learned was that unlike some other genres like strategy or worker placement games, the betting game genre was actually pretty unsaturated. And by that, I mean there weren't that many games in that space. And so that meant there was a big opportunity for us to innovate in that space and introduce a new game that had improvements in the genre and could attract new types of players. We also wanted to check out and see if there were any other games made by first-time game developers like us. We were going to self-publish our game using a crowdfunding platform called Kickstarter. And so on Kickstarter, we found a few other game developers who pioneered in the space and they were able to show us that there was hope for people like us, people who didn't know how to make games before. And we saw that they were able to raise different amounts of money, ranging from $52,000 all the way up to $160,000. The next step that we took is we had to find an artist for our game. We didn't know that much of art. I majored in communications, like I mentioned, and my co-designer, he majored in business and marketing. And so we took to Twitter to find an artist. We used hashtags like hashtag portfolio day to find different artists online around the world who were available to commission art for. And that's how we came across Cheryl Young, a Hong Kong-based illustrator. What we liked about Cheryl was that Cheryl was very responsive, eager to work with us, and most importantly, Cheryl was affordable in our college student budget. <laughs> the only challenge was that Cheryl mostly did freelance art for a Minecraft server, and so a lot of their art was blocky or had a lot of square people. So we had Cheryl, we hired Cheryl to do a couple of different test pieces where we told them about what type of game we were trying to make, the tone of the game, and from the initial sketches that Cheryl sent us, we saw that there was some potential here, and we decided to move forward with Cheryl as our artist. While working with Cheryl, we decided that we needed to develop a unique art style for our game. Most other games in the board game space, especially ones with ancient Rome or ancient Greece, had a more painterly, serious, realistic art style. But since our game was shorter, more fun, and lighthearted, we wanted something that matched that tone more. And so we worked with Cheryl to come up with this art style that was more colorful, a little bit less serious, uh, a little bit more cartoony, but not too cartoony, and that was more expressive. And since we wanted our game to be a little bit funny, we wanted it to be, we wanted it to be social and engaging, we also made sure that our art style could capture this humor in a way that wouldn't make that art tonally dissonant from the rest of the art. Next, we did something that many game developers <laughs> unfortunately overlook, but it's actually a very important part of making a game, which is figuring out the business of what you're making. I worked with one of my un university friends named Natalie Lee, uh, who majored in finance, in order to build a pricing model and financial projections for our game. So on the screen here, you can see an example of the pricing model we built, where we took things like the manufacturing cost, the freight, the shipping, all other costs, and then 
we tried to figure out how much should we price our game and how much should we price shipping in each country so that way we could hit the target profit margin that we would want to reach. We also figured out how much money we would make if we sold a small number of units of the game, a medium amount, a large amount, and we also put together a profit and loss statement. After that, we went to over 25 different gaming events and conventions where we play-tested Gladius with over 1,000 different people. And the reason that we did this is because as indie developers, we didn't have the big budgets to compete with the user acquisition and other marketing programs that big studios had. So our strategy was to go to these smaller, more niche events and target those players and hope that if they see us, uh, small business owners, small indie creators, they would be inspired to support us and sign up for our email list and follow us on social media and hopefully back our game on Kickstarter once we eventually launched. While we were playtesting with these many hundreds and thousands of, uh, of playtesters, we also repeatedly iterated on the design. There is, this, there is this philosophy in game development called failing faster. And the idea here is that typically when you make a game, you don't just make a game and it's awesome right from the get-go. Let's ship it. Here you go. More often what happens is you make a prototype for a game, there are some glimmers of hope, some parts of it are fun, but it's rough. There are definitely mistakes, there are definitely things that you need to improve on in that game. And that's why it's typically recommended to go through a design iteration loop where you play test the game, you collect data and feedback from your play testers where you either observe them and write notes, you ask them questions, you have them fill out a survey, and once you get all of those learnings, you iterate on the design. You make different tweaks, tweaks to it, and then you play test it and do the loop over and over and over again. And the idea is that you want to fail as quickly as possible, so that way you can get your game into as good of a shape as you can, so it's ready to ship. And once we did all of this, we realized that we were headed in the right direction because we started receiving awards, accolades, and media coverage for our game. So this is a good sign because that meant that our game was good enough to get awards and also be featured in publications, which also helped spread the word. And the last thing that we did to make our board game was we created a compelling Kickstarter page. One of the things that we learned from our market research was that a non-negotiable was having a great Kickstarter page because this was essentially the page that would sell our game to lots and lots of different potential customers and it needed to be aesthetically pleasing, well thought out, well organized, and make a convincing sell argument so that way we could get people to buy and support our game. And then in February 2020, right before the pandemic put everyone in lockdown, we launched Gladius on Kickstarter, crossed our fingers, and hoped that it would do well. And thankfully, Gladius did do well. It raised over $1,000 thanks to the help of 3,500 backers. Now, so how did I leverage this experience learning how to make a tabletop game to transition to a full-time career in video games? My plan from the get-go was, step one, learn how to make a board game and self-publish it so that way it would hopefully be a stepping stone to get into the games industry. And I was able to get a job at Wizards of the Coast, the game studio behind games like Magic the Gathering and Dungeons and & Dragons. And my hope was, after that, I would, I would ideally have a video game career at a AAA game studio. While I was working at Wizards of the Coast, I mostly worked on Magic the Gathering products, including a lot of their sets, and a lot of their crossovers with brands like Warhammer, Stranger Things, and Lord of the Rings. And even though I really enjoyed working at Wizards of the Coast, in the middle of 2020, I started thinking about what my end goal was, what my dreams were. And I reminded myself that a big reason why I started pursuing making my own tabletop game was because I eventually wanted to end up being a video game developer. And right around that time, Riot Games posted a job listing for a game producer. And when I read it, 
I immediately lit up because the responsibilities and what they were looking for were exactly what I was looking for. And it seemed right in my wheelhouse. So I applied. The recruiter immediately reached out to me the next day to initiate interviews. I interviewed six different times with them. And by the end of the interview process, I was feeling pretty good about it. Everybody was giving me little hints and nods that I had done pretty well. And I thought, I have this in the bag. I asked the recruiter at the end of the interview process, when can I expect you to get back to me? And he had said, a couple of days. We'll get back to you in a couple of days. So I eagerly waited a few days. I didn't hear back. I waited a few more days. I didn't hear back. And soon, a week had passed. And it was killing me because they didn't say anything to me. So I followed up with the recruiter, and I asked them if they had made a decision. And unfortunately, what had ended up happening was they had passed on me, and I didn't get the job. And I was devastated. I remember that I literally laid down on the floor of my apartment, and I cried because I was so sad that I had come so close to my dream job only to fall short in the end. And I was pretty sad for a couple of weeks, didn't want to do anything. And then a thought came to my mind. Am I just going to give up because I encountered one failure? No. Instead, what if I approached applying to game dev jobs the way I approach making a game? But instead of working on a game, the game, or the product in this case, would be me. I would apply and interview to different game development jobs. I'd collect data and feedback from the interviewers about how I performed, and then I would interview on my, or, and then I would iterate on myself as a candidate in terms of my resume, my skills, my interviewing abilities, and then apply and interview all over again until eventually I would be a good enough candidate to hire. So I went back to the Riot recruiter. And I asked them, and this was not very fun, <laughs> not very fun for my ego, but very important for learning. I asked them, could you please give me feedback on my interview? Because I want to know what different things that I can improve on for the future. And so I took a detailed list of all of the feedback that they gave me. They told me that I came off as more of a facilitator than a leader. They wanted me to further develop my product management skills. They pointed out that I mostly worked on tabletop games, and even though I had worked on an R&D video game, I hadn't actually shipped a video game yet. I lacked experience in agile game development, which is one of the most popular software and game development methodologies. I didn't have that much experience working with technical disciplines like engineering, and I wasn't familiar with Unity or Jira. So I took this feedback and observation list, and I immediately figured out ways that I could overcome them. First, I started out by reading a whole textbook called Agile Game Development to learn the entire process of making a game with the Agile methodology. I became a certified Scrum master and a certified Scrum product owner, so that way I can learn more about product management and the production process. I took a class called Intro to Game Making by a, group called Co uh, by a group called Code Coven that focuses on helping people of marginalized genders learn how to make games. And while in that class, I learned how to make multiple different games in Unity by programming them myself. And then finally, I entered a game jam with a group of friends where I worked as a narrative designer and also a game designer on a game called Haze of the Plant Witch, where you play as a witch who has a device that allows you to speak to plants and solve narrative-driven puzzles. And after doing all of that, I reapplied, and I ended up getting not one, but four job offers, including one for Legends of Runeterra, which is Riot Games' digital card game. So now, I want to share with you what skills and practices that I've learned that are helpful for making video games. The first thing is, if you're making a video game, you should establish a product vision and strategy. If you're going to make a game, 
you don't want to just shoot an arrow anywhere. You want to know what you're aiming for, generally speaking, so that way you can increase the chance that you're going to hit it. And so that way you have a North Star that's guiding you and the rest of your team throughout the game development process. This is a product vision board that I had found on the internet by Roman Pitchler that you can easily find on the internet as well and fill it out if you're working on a game or any other product or piece of software. There's also an extended version if you want to fill out even more fields to help you while you're building your game or product. Next, if you're making a game, you want to conduct market research on comparable games. So for example, if you're trying to make a multi-platform battle royale game on different devices like PC, mobile, and console, you should probably research other successful and unsuccessful battle royale games like Fortnite, Garena Free Fire, PUBG Mobile, among others. So that way you can learn about what makes them successful, what made some of them fail, what are the different things that they offer, and where are the different areas of opportunity where the game that you're working on can solve those issues. If you're working on a very small team and you're trying to make an independent farming simulation slash RPG, you should probably research other games in the genre and also games created by other small indie teams. Like Stardew Valley, Story of Seasons, and Rune Factory are all very popular indie farming RPG games. But on the other hand, you could also check out some games like Garden Story and Unpacking, which were made by very small independent developers, but were able to find success uh, broadly. Next, create paper prototypes to help answer key questions about your game quickly and cheaply. So in this example, you can see a level in a game that I worked on in three different stages. The first one is the paper prototype. This was made using random hero skate pieces at my house, some random cubes, and a miniature. And this is how we mocked up a level in the game, just to see if it was fun, if the systems we made worked, before we ever invested into making a digital version of the game. Next, we put it in Tabletop simula Simulator, which is essentially a physics engine that allows you to take different types of pieces and move them around with anybody around the world who has a computer, so that way you can test your game systems. And finally, once the game level that we were working on made it through these various phases, we worked with our artist and our programmer to actually build the game in Unity. And you can see the final version at the end. And if you're doubtful that this could work for your video game, you can hear from me at both, at both Wizards of the Coast and at Riot Games, regardless of what type of game we're working on, you'll often find game designers paper prototyping what they're making. And on top of that, you'll often see game designers uh, using different wireframing tools like Adobe XD or Figma to prototype and test their game designs before they actually build it in Unity or Unreal or whatever engine that they're using. Next, leverage prioritization methods for better decision making. Have you ever wondered, when you're making a game, how do we decide what we should build? Unfortunately, when you're, with, when you're working on a game, you, can't, you typically can't build everything that you want unless you have unlimited money and time, which most people do not have. So in order to make the best decisions possible, something that I do at work is I use different prioritization methods like this. So you can see on the screen, this is a feature backlog template that I use, where on the left, I have my team fill out every single feature that we are interested in potentially making, and we describe what it is. Then we answer, why do we want this in the game? Right? Like, we want to add a fishing mini game, or we want to add matchmaking, whatever feature it is. We have to answer why we want to put it in our game. So that way we can get a better understanding of what value it'll add for our players and for the type of game that we're making. After that, we use a prioritization, we add a prioritization field over here where typically I as a producer go through and I evaluate all of the features and I use something called the Moscow method, which stands for must, should, could, and won't to figure out how to prioritize the features. 
must means we absolutely need this feature to ship. We are not going to ship this game without this feature. Should means we should probably have this in our game. We're not going to hold up launching this game uh, if it's not in there, but it's, it's very important. Could is, this is a nice to have. We'd like to have this in our game, but it's not a hill anybody is going to die on to get it into our game. And then won't is essentially, we are not going to have this in our game right now. It doesn't make sense, so we're not going to have it. If we're making a live game or a game that has updates later, maybe we'll make it later. And then finally, once I have all of this information, I work with the rest of the game developers, and I ask them to size the feature. Essentially, give me an estimate of how much time or effort or complexity it would take to build the feature. Typically, we use t-shirt sizes, like small, medium, large. Uh, other times, we use story points. So that way, I can get a better understanding of approximately how much time and how long it would take to make each feature. Here are some other prioritization methods you can check out. Like I mentioned, I use the Moscow model, but there are also a bunch of other ones like the Kano model, the Rice scoring model, uh, and the others that you can see on the screen that you can check out online for whatever game or whatever piece of software that you're working on. And the last lesson that I want to impart with all of you is that just because you don't know how to do something doesn't mean that you can't figure out how. I started out as a 19-year-old university student where I didn't know anything about how to make a game. And as I was trying to pursue game development as a full-time career, there were many different times where people tried to intimidate me, where people doubted me, where people said I should just give up because it was never going to happen. But I pushed, I pushed through that because I knew that every successful person that I looked up to started in my very position where they too were a young person. They too were a student, and they had a dream. So no matter what you're trying to achieve, it's OK if you don't know how to do it yet, because you can most certainly learn how to do it. And with that, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure uh, chatting with all of you today. Thank you. I'd like to know if anyone has questions for Victoria. Um, this question is more on behalf of a friend of mine who couldn't be here today. Mm -hmm. And is, as a computer science student in, the, in Europe, you who really wants to work at Riot Games in game design or something related, what steps should I take to achieve this goal? Since internships outside Europe need permission to work in the US and within Europe there's a lot less offer, how should I proceed? And what skills, both soft and technical, should I develop? Like having a good understanding of Unity when applying to game design, for example, that would catch the eye of a Riot recruiter and increase my chances. Oh, that's a good question. So what I would typically recommend is you go on the Riot Careers website and you check out what different types of jobs or internships are available. And usually on those job listings, it'll tell you what the responsibilities of the role are, uh, what different skills they're looking for, and it'll also talk about different like legal requirements or like citizenship types of requirements. In terms of if you're a student in Portugal and you're trying to get a job at Riot, I would definitely check out the website because I think it would have more information there. I'm unfortunately not a recruiter, so I'm not an expert in it. Uh, but I do know that there are different people, like there was Katarina Macedo. She used to work at Riot Games, and she's from Portugal. Um, and I know that Riot also has different offices here in different countries in Europe as well, or different offices here in Europe as well. Uh, I would like to add Katarina Macedo was part of Sinfo. Uh, does anyone else have questions for Victoria? Um, hello. Um, as a so, how do I phrase this? Um, from the very beginning, before you were a game designer, and uh, now that you are a lead producer and more experienced, what is the skill that you think you didn't have before and uh, 
what's the skill that most evolved for you and is m most important for you now that you're in a senior role? A senior role? Ah, uh, yes. I would say that when I first started out, whenever I was playing games, I was only viewing the game as a player. So I would think of it from the perspective of, how do I win? How do I have fun? I wasn't thinking so much about, well, what decisions did the game developers make while creating this game in order to create this experience for me and for my other friends who play this game? And from the process of designing my own board game and also working on different indie video games when I participated in game jams, I learned that it was something very difficult and something that I needed to, to hone my craft in to get better. And from trying different things and testing it on players and seeing how they react, I learned about what types of things players, tip, uh, what types of things players typically liked, things that they didn't like, uh, faster and easier ways to achieve different types of things that I wanted in my designs. So I would say overall design thinking was the most important thing that I learned. And it's very helpful regardless of if you're a game designer, a programmer, a producer, an artist, because uh, like if you're working on a game, you always should keep the player in mind. It's, it's typically helpful if you don't only focus on your craft and showing prowess in your craft, but instead thinking, hey, if I'm making art for this game, what is this doing for the entire game experience? If I'm programming this, how is my programming contributing to the experience that we want players to have? So that's what I would say. Thank you. Uh, more questions? Okay. Uh, how important is it to create and balance in games to keep the players engaged? And is it something that developers take into consideration when um, doing the design choices? To create and balance your... Uh, yeah, to create uh, and balance in the game. So oh, okay, so like keeping it fair. Uh, uh, like uh, no, keep it, sometimes making it, uh, making, for instance, in League of Legends, some champions too strong. Oh, <laughs> right, right, I see, I see. Oh, so, so I personally don't work on League of Legends, so I'm not, I'm not a champion designer. So instead, I'll talk about um, my, my personal experiences with it. So uh, typically, when you're working on a game, you put together a philosophy for the game that you're working on. Some games are st more strategy focused, and so you want to make it as fair as possible. So that way, uh, it can focus as much as possible on the skill of the player and keep things fair if you're competing. So games like League of Legends are, are like this. Magic the Gathering, uh, another game that I worked on, was like this. But there are also other types of games where maybe fairness and balance isn't as important. I don't have any examples right now, but um, let, me, let me try to think of some. But yes, like, it's not as important than some other games. So I would say uh, in, in like a game like that, you would want to, you would try to focus as much as possible uh, on hitting those types of goals. But as a, design, uh, as a game designer, it's very hard to achieve those goals sometimes. And if you put out a design and you test with a group of people that you have at work, you can try to achieve those goals as much as possible, but it's very different when you play test with maybe 10 people versus when it goes out to hundreds, thousands, millions of players. And so players will often find, time, find different things that you never found when you were testing. Uh, they'll find ways to break your game or find cool new ways to play your game. And then you have to learn from the players and make updates and changes if you're a live game or keep it in mind if you're going to make other games in the future. So, Hopefully that answers your question to a degree. Thank you. We only have time for one more question before we end out the, the prize for the giveaway. So, uh, Hello. Uh, you mentioned you come from a, a game design background. Uh, I would like to know, like, because you work for a very big company, how much creative freedom and creative input do you have in the games that you are working on, or if it's mostly just spreadsheets all day? Oh, yes. I would say that it depends on 
what game team you work on and what sort of role that you have. So for me, I'm a producer and I lead an initiative of about 20 or 30 people or something like that. And my working style is I'm very collaborative and the rest of my team is very collaborative. So we're not, we're not a team where one person is the dominant person and other people can't share their ideas. We're very much good ideas can come from anywhere, whether you're a game designer or you're an artist or you're anybody else on the team. And, uh, and with that being said, I don't, like in my particular role, I'm not mostly in spreadsheets. I would say that in my role, I'm focused more on leadership. So bringing different people together so that way we can all collaborate and work on developing the game together. Because when you're working on a game team with lots of different people, it becomes even more challenging to have a cohesive player experience. And it requires making sure that everybody's in harmony, everyone is communicating together. And it's not just one, idea, one person's idea wins or a few different people have two competing ideas. You want to make sure that you're working together and all of your ideas are in service of the vision of the game that you're trying to make. Thank you so much, Victoria. Victoria will also be available just outside the auditorium by the left at our showcase to answer more questions and doubts. But thank you so much. Please, a round of applause for her.